morning, everyone, and welcome to the, the last lecture on random matrices and, and universality for this semester. Um, let me maybe start with, with recalling a few things. Um, so basically, what we are currently doing is we're in the proof of, of this theorem 4.2, um, which compares two, two solution to the, to the DBM dynamics. So we, we have eigenvalues lambda 1 up to lambda n of a real Wigner matrix and eigenvalues mu 1 up to mu n of a GOE matrix. And uh, then we consider lambda t and mu t, which are the solutions of the, of the dis uh, yeah, which are the, the, which are Dyson Brownian motions. So they are solutions of the stochastic differential equation given here. Uh, so yeah, we have a constant, constant uh, diffusion uh, coefficient here in front of the front of the Brownian motion and then we have this um, uh, we have this drift term uh, and then yeah for the mu's we have we have the very same the very same evolution and the important thing here is that both are driven by the same Brownian motions b1 up to bn that's also something which we have already seen in in chapter uh, chapter th or section three uh, where we studied the the Dyson Brownian motion, so the evolution of these of these equations, and then it was also helpful in in many aspects if you wanted to compare two solutions to have the very same Brownian motion here. Okay, so that's our setup, and then what we want to prove is um, that the lambda k is close to the mu k uh, up to a certain error term, namely namely this error term here. So n to the epsilon for each epsilon uh, divided by n. Uh, over uh, divided by n times t, um, uh, and this holds for all t in in zero one, and then yeah, last uh, last uh, no two weeks ago we used this to prove edge to prove edge universality. So at the edge we know that the eigenvalues fluctuate on a scale n to the minus two third. So we had to choose the t to be n to the minus one third and a little bit more uh, to prove that the lambda k and the mu k have the same the same distribution have the same kind of fluctuations. And of course, this as as most of the statements we are we are working with, oops, this uh, this holds with very high probability for any any fixed epsilon. Okay, so that's the that's the setup. And then uh, last week we already made a few uh, steps towards the proof. Um, so the most important things were that we actually or the, the first important things we had to do was to introduce uh, various kinds of notations. So we had these, uh, op we defined these objects x nu, which are parameterized by a nu in, in zero one. And they are the convex combination of the uh, initial condition lambda zero. And the, uh, that's the initial condition of the, of the Wigner matrix. And then we have the initial condition mu zero uh, of the GOE. So the eigenvalues of the, of the GOE. And then we evolve this with the with the same uh, with the same kind of uh, equation, so with the same kind of dynamics that also that so these are also Dyson Brownian motions with different different initial conditions. And um, the important thing here was yeah maybe I should have remark should remark this as well. So so this implies that if I take the new derivative uh, of x nu at zero then I get, um, uh, what was it? It's nu zero, uh, mu zero minus lambda zero. And similarly, one can, one can do a similar transfer, or one can see something similar um, for, for positive times, for, for, for positive t, if one makes this definition here, namely then one, one sees something similar uh, that, uh, so, well, I can also squeeze this somewhere in uh, just to, it's all a recollection from, from what we've seen last time, namely here, if I want to compare the x, k, nu at uh, one, um, which is of course the, uh, at one we have the mu's. Uh, now what am I doing? No, here there has to be one here and at time t, then I get the mu t of k and uh, the lambda k of t 
is xk at zero for time t. And because of that, we get that um, if I want to compare mu t minus lambda k t, then this is up to this time factor. So, uh, so it's e to the minus t zero one u nu t k d nu. Okay, so that's the the reason why this this u k is helpful. And on the other hand, um, the u k satisfies a nice equation. Uh, it's this kind of heat equation. Uh, yeah, I didn't didn't recall the definition of the B, but yeah, as I motivated last time, this is some kind of Laplace operator, and um, and the initial condition are, are just this, uh, are just this initial condition here essentially, and um, and yeah, this this equation had has many nice features. Uh, I listed I listed some of them last last week, and we are gonna study them today also in the exercise session. Uh, so the U UK was the first tool, and then we had a, a second. Um, then we had a, a second auxiliary quantity, which was the VK. Uh, these are the absolute values of the mu K minus lambda K. You remember that, um, and then yeah, for for positive times we evolved the the V with the same with the same equation as the U's. And you remember that this uh, that such an equation has the nice property that if I start with some um, uh, if I start with something positive, then uh, along the time this positivity is kept. So uh, the VTs will also be positive because these here are, are positive initially, and and that's very helpful in the, the in the use of the following quantity. This is this function FT tilde, which will in some sense define us the uh, the convergence or will will give us the convergence because we will get an an estimate uh, or, well I already last time I, I stated the result and we'll prove it today we'll get a nice estimate on the on the ft tilde of z uh, which will ensure that um, or which will help us then to prove the to prove this theorem 4.2 that I that I just recalled okay and last time we already had uh, uh, we already made a few steps towards the proof of theorem 4.2 uh, namely, I claimed proposition 5.4, which had a few small typos that I apparently overlooked uh, when I uh, wrote it up last time. So uh, first of all, well, I should not say epsilon here because it's actually the gamma in the definition of the of the spectral domain S uh, that comes here in as error terms. So the the event we are really looking at is the imaginary part of F T uh, tilde of Z. Uh, and then here, uh, maybe I should just cancel out these things so that there's really no, I should remove the wrong things. Um, so yeah, this error term here should be an n to the gamma over two. And um, and also here, back here, the new, we, we will not get, um, so if you look if you look at the definition, um, if you look at the different, so in order to prove this uniformly in in eta, uh, in nu, inside here we would have to do some kind of continuity argument in nu, but it's it will be very difficult to control the continuity of of ft in nu, uh, at least in some in some strong Lipschitz sense, because um, this is basically if if you take a derivative here of nu in with respect to nu. Then you will get all kinds of blow-ups if two if two eigenvalues come close, and and these are very hard to control. This is actually the the kind of we will along the way uh, that this argument works. We will actually avoid controlling these um, controlling these shocks when eigenvalues come close quantitatively, and that's the whole uh, that's the whole beauty of of this approach where you use this this f tilde compared to uh, to having to track what happens with the when the eigenvalues come close. So we will not be able to do this continuity argument and that's why it was wrong here to, to have it uniformly in, to have it uniformly in nu. So this is, uh, this should not have been there. So the, the, the correct statement is, is this here. So it's, it's of the same, the same flavor. It's just that the error term 
is, is less general uh, and we don't have this, this uniformity in new. And um, last time we already concluded from proposition 5.4, we concluded the following corollary, which is now correct uh, for all epsilon because I can just choose here. Um, so here there is no, no Z dependence anymore. So whenever I want to get another epsilon, I can choose another gamma here. So the epsilon, the end to the epsilon error term here is still correct, but we are, I also claimed that it's uniform, that it holds uniformly in eta, uh, sorry, uniformly in nu, uh, which is also not correct. So that's, uh, that should be out. And, um, and this we already proved last time. And uh, now I want to use, we can directly use this corollary 5.5 um, to prove theorem 4.2. So what I recalled in the beginning. And, um, and then I will say a few things about, there was also proposition 5.3, which I stated last time, but I didn't say anything about its proof. And also I will say something about the, the, the proof of, of proposition 5.4 here. Okay. So that was uh, a recollection. And now we go back to the proof of, of theorem 4.2. So that means the task will be to control how far is lambda from, from mu. Okay. And um, so now as I announced, ah, yeah, maybe I should have. So yeah, you can maybe take a, a picture here with the with the corrected uh, with the corrected results and um yeah as i said then we can we can now use this corollary 5.5 to to get the proof of theorem to give a proof of theorem 4.2 and um First, I want to use that the that I have this kind of information about the the equation, namely this this equation for u and for v. So, if you recall from last time, we had this proposition 5.1, which listed a few properties. I don't want to recall all of them, um, but in particular, what we had is that um, that if I have two solutions that are initially they have fulfill an orders an order relation in such a sense that uh, if I have a solu one solution and the um, and I have another one which is entry is bigger, then along the the flow along the equation this will be this order will be kept, and that's exactly what we can use here. Namely, we get that u k of t is smaller than v k of t. Um, for all k in n and for all all times and for all t. Right, that's the nice, it's one of these nice relations for these equations. And um, and therefore I can directly I can directly use this result here to get valuable information about the u. So uh, hence by corollary. 5.5 for any epsilon tilde bigger than zero. Uh, this event we are now put in the u. Uh, and yeah, I should somehow keep the new. Uh, it's smaller than n, and then I have this maximum k hat over n to the one third in T. Okay, and this holds for all K and for all T. Yeah, here we only care about T in zero one. And this um, holds, or maybe better occurs. With very high probability, and yet it's uniform, uniformly for new being in in zero one. Okay, so so now we already 
mapped everything back into you and, re and recall that if I integrate you along eta, uh, then I get the difference between lambda k and mu k. So that's, that's what we, that's what we want. And, um, and now we introduce some characteristic function, which will be useful in the following. Uh, so I look at the event when um, uh, u nu of zero, the supremum norm of this is smaller than one uh, for all nu in, in zero one. And then by the maximum principle, we know that uh, for any later times, the supremum norm will not will not get bigger than one on this event because of the yeah because of the uh, structure of the equation for u. And then um, by yeah I can recall what the u is at time zero, so it's lambda, it's mu of lambda, well, sorry mu of zero minus lambda of zero, uh, and this holds actually for all for all new in zero one. Um, and on the other hand, I can use the rigidity uh, by smuggling in the right quantiles of the semicircle distribution. So mu k gamma k plus lambda k of zero minus gamma k. And yeah, this is smaller than uh, n to the minus two third then I have this k to the minus k hat to the minus one third times n to the n to the epsilon. Um, and this holds this very high probability. This is just rigidity. So yeah, maybe you want to take another snapshot now. And then this means that because I have now rigidity and this bound here is of course much smaller than uh, much smaller than one. So that means that the, that the he here, so this characteristic function will be one with very high probability. And in the following, we will always work on, we'll always work on this event. Okay, so let me state this. So that means he is one was very high probability. And, um, uh, okay. And then also I can use the maximum principle for the, for this discrete parabolic equation. So my proposition 5.1, I think it was the second part. Um, we have that if I have a, a u nu k at some time t, and I multiply it with she, then this is smaller than one uh, for all t in zero, one, and all, well, t could even be bigger, bigger than one, and all nu in, in zero, one. Um, okay, and yeah, of course, uh, Oh. Okay, and N. Um, okay, and now we will work towards getting these kind of uniform estimates in eta, uh, sorry, in nu, uh, where I said before that one cannot do a continuity argument. And usually if, if you cannot do a continuity argument, then it's helpful to compute moments because the moments you can usually estimate better uh, uniformly in these kind of parameters. And uh, actually that's, that's how it will, will come about next. So, um, so because we know that on this event he, uh, he equal to one, um, oh, sorry, chi, I think it's called chi. Um, chi equal to one, uh, we know that this is bounded by, by one. We can use the, what we had before, namely that the U case are, even have some better bound here. Um, with very high probability. And then we can do the usual trick that we convert a very high probability estimate into a, into a moment bound. And that will look as follows. So hence, uh, 
yeah, I can take any epsilon and take a p to define the moment and uh, add the tilde in n. Uh, so we find some c such that the following holds if I take the two piece moment of of my uk nu then this is smaller than can use this error bound that I had before uh, maximum of k hat over n to the one third and t uh, now this is then multiplied with two to the p and plus on the other event i can use the, the bound one any any word bound to that also done uh, and but this this complementary regime only happens with very small probability so i get the i get the usual term here for the for the very high probability estimate okay and now i can i can use what i what i used before or what i said before namely that if i want to find out what the mu k minus lambda k at time t is then i can rewrite it in terms of u so i get this e to the minus uh, t over 2 i have to integrate from 0 to 1 to nu the u nu k of t with respect to nu uh, and then i can i can do the follow following estimates so now i uh, uh, we want to get an, an estimate in in very high probability sense so of course we can by markov inequality it's enough to to estimate moments that's what we will do now so i have the lambda k minus mu k to the 2p and i also multiplied with c and note that uh, i can always uh, i could also add a, an n to the uh, uh, 2p up here because the new is zero one valued, so this power doesn't change. Uh, that I will use tacitly in the following. Uh, but first, what I want to do is so now I I can plug in this this here. I can forget about this factor. This is smaller than one, and um, uh, yeah. So I, for now, I just plug this in. So that's the expectation. He times and then i have this integral uh, u k nu t p nu to the 2p and um what i then do is i uh, now of course i want to write it in such a way that the x that the integral comes outside here so that i can use Fubini uh to to get it to rewrite it into moments of the to write it into moments of the use here and um, and to that end I can use Jensen's inequality to pull the to pull the absolute value and the 2p inside of this new integral so this is the same as uh, and then I can use Fubini to to exchange them so this is the same as expectation chi uh, u k nu t 2p d nu and then because everything up there is is uniform in nu um i can i can do the following i can uh, uh yes i already said i can use markov's inequality uh, and then yeah i have to to choose the epsilon tilde p and d tilde appropriately, but uh, this I don't want to do in detail. Choosing so epsilon tilde p and d tilde appropriately um, implies that for each epsilon bigger than zero um we have the following we have lambda kt minus mu kt is smaller than 
epsilon divided by uh, by n uh, and then yeah i want to give this maximum actually name i don't want to write it like many times now mkt um uh, I, yeah so the let me write it here so the mkt is this maximum that i uh, to the one third and t uh, so and this holds um what occurs with very high probability uh, and it holds at least uniformly um for t in zero one uh, Ah, uh, oh yeah, maybe you should take some snapshots. So yeah, that's what we, we did before. And now, of course, this moment approach has the disadvantage that now I lost the uniformity in T, at least temporarily, um, because, um, yeah, because I had to do here a Markov inequality, and then I get such kind of moments, but I don't get any supremum over T or anything like this. So now I have only, only seen it for, for fixed T. And, um, ah, sorry, I actually forgot something. So there's of course still a he here, um, but he also occurs with very high probability. So I can, uh, uh, so I can pull, pull this out. So since he is equal to one, it's very high probability. Um, We have actually the same thing as before. Uh, so lambda kt minus mu kt without the he, and it still holds with very high probability. Mkt. Uh, maybe I can put this out. It's very high. with very high probability and um, yeah, and it's still uniformly in T oh, well, four, and of course also in K as I should have also said before. And then yeah, one can do the, the usual union bound uh, and, and continuity ideas. So yeah, maybe you want to take another not sure here. I don't know how you, far you've already recorded it, and um, uh, and that's what we want to do. Um, but we, we for that we need some kind of Lipschitz continuity in T uh, of the lambda and the mu, um, and this I will pre I will not do in detail, but um, but I want to sketch it now how to how it can be done. Uh, Um, sorry. Um, okay, so this can be done as follows be, um, because we can write it as eigenvalues of a matrix. Um, and this matrix, um, for this matrix, we can then use that eigenvalues are continuous if you change the matrix and then uh, our Lipschitz continues. So the lambda t is in distribution the same as the eigenvalues uh, of a certain matrix. Namely, if I take this here, then I put the, then I insert the diagonal matrix, which has the lambda zero at the diagonal plus, and then e to the minus t to the one half u tilde uh, and the mu t is the same. Um, but of course I started mu of zero. And 
the utility here is some some GUE. And yeah, I can choose it independent of uh, what was it H zero. And then was it W or was it uh, ah, U1? Okay. And U1. Okay. And then um, since eigenvalues, I will write it a bit a bit sketchy or informally, but I guess you have seen this. Since eigenvalues uh, are Lipschitz continuous uh, functions of the matrix. So yeah, it's a little bit informal. I don't specify the norms or so, but uh, you remember that in these kind of uniform um, continuity arguments to extend a certain bound to to a bigger space, you can even afford an independent unif uh, independent uh, Lipschitz continuity constants. So this is not a this is not a problem. This is not a problem. Uh, is a little bit, uh, a union bound. And continuity argument extends the um, yeah. Remember there was a difference between uniform the uniform bound in star. So yeah, that should be star. Uh, Uniform bound in star to a bound simultaneous in T That's an important word here. In K, uh, that uh, yeah, and this is the, the statement we want because that means we can we can actually take this event here and then add the T and the K inside the event, so it holds it holds uniformly. Um, and this proves the theorem as uh, yeah, this MKT is of course bigger than T. If I only want an upper bound, then I can replace this. Okay, so that was the that was the proof of this theorem 4.2. Um, so yeah, I didn't. This last part here with the continuity argument, I guess you have. You've kind of seen it, and I guess the most important observation is to see that these are actually Lipschitz continuous in T because they come from some from some random matrix. Uh, they they come from some matrix model where the uh, the things are controlled. Um, so yeah, this was this was proposition. Uh, this was theorem four point two, and now um, then uh, from last time there there are two big propositions left that we. We still need to prove, uh, and one of them is proposition uh, five point three, which I want to recall now first, and then later I will also say something about the proof of of four point two uh, five of proposition five point four, which I already recalled in the beginning, and um, now I've already prepared something. Maybe I copy this a bit further up. Um, namely, I just want to recall what this proposition uh, what this proposition five point uh, five point three said and um, and then I want to give you some ideas of the proof. Unfortunately, the proof is a bit longer, so I cannot I cannot give the 
I cannot give the whole proof, but I will I will give, focus on the on the main ideas. So yeah, so uh, this is this new new subsection where we want to discuss about the main ideas of the the proof of proposition 5.4. So to that end, I recall this this definitions of the of the spectral domain that we used last time. So um, yeah, we had we had the function kappa which uh, which measures the distance to the next edge for any spectral parameter z, uh, and then we looked at the spectral domain uh, s, uh, which is the usual form. So I have uh, complex numbers in the positive upper half plane, real part e, imaginary part eta. Uh, here now the the point was that the e is a little bit away from the spectral edges, uh, minus two and two. And the eta is somewhat fixed. That had just some was just convenient for for notational purposes. And then we looked at the domain R, which is just the time evolution. Uh, okay, maybe I should have recalled this as well. Uh, which is the time evolution of this um, uh, of this characteristic Z T. And uh, they looked as follows. So they were one half. Uh, they had a one half here. Then um, there was a, a factor e to the t, e to the minus t over two. And um, and they were multiplied with certain. Uh, certain complex weights, also certain weights of the Z. So it looks as like this actually, Z plus Z squared minus four. So that already reminds quite a bit in the Stilts transform of the semicircle. And then E to the minus T over two Z minus Z squared to the four. And yeah, so, so this you should think of as, um, as an evolution of this point T in time, and actually one can easily check that the imaginary part of this is, is increased. So uh, if I start at the point Z in S, then the imaginary part will increase uh, compared to the initial point Z equal to, to uh, Z zero. And, um, and then the idea was that we prove the local law, uh, or then this, this proposition 5.3 actually meant that uh, we have a local law and, and rigidity. So in the following sense, so the ST was the Stitches transform. Uh, it's also worth recalling this. So the ST was the Stitches transform defined by the measure, um, which one would naturally associate with these points XT, uh, XK nu T. Right, so that's the that was the definition of the ST. <coughs> so yeah, I guess if you if you think of these objects here as being eigenvalues, then this is the Stilts transform of this empirical spectral measure. Uh, and then here the claim was that the um, ST is close to M, the Stilts transform of the semicircle with the usual error term on this whole spectral domain R. Uh, and now it holds uniform in, in T and in, in nu. So here it's, uh, here to, to get the uniformity is not a problem because the X, they're easily, con uh, Xs you can control easily in, uh, well, you can easily control the X, deriv the first derivative of X with respect to nu, these are the U's. Um, but then, so, so here it's easy to get uniformity, but for the other statement that, that we had before, uh, this is actually harder. So the first part here uh, is this is this local law um, part that states that uh, that the A1 uh, occurs with very high probability, and uh, then we have the the second part where you compare the x um, the x k nu t with the gamma k. So the, the quantiles of the semicircle distribution, and that's the rigidity. 
and this also occurs with the high probability and here everything is also uniform in t or simultaneous in t and simultaneous in in u it should be maybe be a bit more precise here and um and that's the statement that i want to explain now and um i think i can still uh, give the main ideas before the break and then maybe make the break a little bit later um but uh, yeah as i said i will be a, a bit sketchy here so first of all um i guess you all remember from last from last year or last semester um so yeah the, what i want to do now is i want to give these main ideas uh, of the proof of proposition 5.3 um so yeah, as you remember last time last from last semester the the uh, to get this kind of rigidity bounds it was enough to have a to have a local law uh that's sufficiently strong so in fact that's the only thing what that one needs to do so it suffices um to show that this event a1 holds uh with very high probability. And um, yeah, maybe I should make as a side remark, uh, you remember that uh, one would need some kind of a bit larger, larger spectral domain on some larger spectral. Uh, domain with an improvement outside so yeah there were these technical um, uh, was improved error bounds outside minus two two um was that the, what does that mean so remember that uh, first of all we need bit bigger spectral domain that also includes the edges. Now in this S and this R, they, they were excluded. Uh, and then also what we need is that uh, out, that we can control the largest eigenvalue so we can avoid that this goes, goes off to infinity. And for that, we needed some improved error bounds uh, outside the, um, outside the, the usual spectrum, outside the, the spectrum or the support of the, of the semicircle. Okay, so we can focus on on the on the local law and um first i want to stress that uh we have rigidity for all new uh, at time equal equal to zero so by eigenvalue rigidity so if i take the xk new at zero and compare it with the gamma k uh, this is smaller than just by the definition uh, because this is a convex combination, so mu k zero minus gamma k, um, and then of course this one can make smaller than the usual, than yeah, as small as, the, as one usually expects the rigidity uh, into the epsilon with very high probability. for every epsilon um, bigger than zero, okay? And uh, that already indicates that initially for all nu, you get the, you would expect the semicircle to be correct. So, um, uh, yes, so that means, hence one can show that the S0 of Z uh, is close to M of Z uh, for every new in zero one. 
okay and um and now we use this um this matrix representation that i had before in the general for general new so set ht nu uh, to be the following e to the minus t um, diac x nu zero uh, plus e to the minus t one half uh, u tilde where u tilde is a goe as we had before and then we know um, my theorem 316 that the x nu t is in distribution the same as the eigenvalues of h t nu. Uh, okay and then um so somehow one uses two uh, two different regimes, uh, namely when the time is small. So um, yeah, I now uh, fix a new in in zero one. Um, so then the the first part is as follows. Um, there is a constant. C in zero one, such that um, I can prove, uh, yes, such that S T Z minus M Z. Uh, yeah, I just want to make it make it informal, but uh, is close to M Z for all T. In, in zero C, so like uh, you, they get, you, you find a small order one constant such that for all small times, uh, you can prove the, the local law we want. And how does this proceed? Um, so the proof uh, proceeds dynamically. So the point here is that you can derive an SDE for the difference of these two things if you use these characteristics. Uh, along these characteristics that that T that uh, that we had before. And then uh, yeah you you use this to show um, uh, yeah, well, control st minus m uh, yeah, using that uh, z sorry s at zero at t equal to zero minus m is small and yeah that the imaginary part uh, grows so the if i take the derivative here then this is this is positive so that's the first part and then once you have it up to time up to time c uh, then you one can use proof use the usual uh, ideas so for to prove a local law so for uh, for t in c up to one um, prove a local law um, yeah and then it's somewhat uh, and the ideas they are similar uh, but it's not not quite the same so one has to work a bit bit more prove a local law following the approach from last semester um yeah and then and using uh, 
that s at time c minus m is small. So you can somewhat extend this, um, extend this. And yeah, I should remark that both of these steps are, of course, as you can imagine, quite quite non-trivial. So they would clearly take us one, two. Uh, well, I guess each of them would take two, at least two lectures. Um, uh, even even referring to the to the last to the results from last year, uh, and then yeah, finally uh, one does the usual thing: uh, union bound uh, less continuity argument in yeah all the parameters. And here, this is this is non. Uh, okay, maybe this was a bit too quick. Now, uh, yeah, maybe you want to take one snapshot here, and uh, another one there, and then yeah, maybe we can then make a make a break before I say something about the proof of of this proposition five point four. Uh, so yeah, maybe I. Maybe I can stop here for now. Um, yeah, then let's let's continue with the uh, with the rest. So before the break, yeah, I somewhat explained a bit about the proof of um, of proposition five point three, and um, and five point three will in particular be used in the proof of uh, of proposition five point four that that I want to. Uh, discuss next. So, um, yes, yeah, I already tried to indicate in the beginning, this will now be a bit more sketchy, uh, but a bit more complete in some sense than, than the proposition 5.3. Um, but first, so the, yeah, uh, I will explain the main, the, the main ideas and, and many steps also in detail, but there are some kind of, in some sense, elementary estimates, which go similar as, for example, analyzing the the Stitches transform of the of the semicircle and all the kinds of scaling it has close to the edge and, and these things uh, that will that I will omit but then I'll I'll try to indicate when there's some some kind of uh, more work to be done which I which I don't want to do okay so but first I I need to to introduce quite a bit of notation and um, throughout the argument we will we will fix it uh, we will fix new and prove it uh, for this. Uh, prove the statement for for this fixed new as it's as it's formulated. Uh, yeah, maybe it's it's good to look at the proposition again. Um, so yeah, it's it's this proposition. Yeah, as you can see, it's it's well, or, uh, at least it's not stated uniformly in new anymore. But um, so everything here happens for fixed new. Um, then we fix the the gamma as anyways fixed, and we work on this on this domain S. And um, and yeah, the the goal will be to prove that we have this uh, we have this kind of upper bound on the imaginary part of the FT tilde here uh, with very high probability. And um, the main idea how how to do it is to to define to in some sense uh, well what we have to do eventually right is is to do a, a kind of continuity argument in in T and in Z. And now here we will already um, we will implement this along the way. So we want to work on a we will first work in a discrete grid, so to say in in the T and in Z, and um, for, to get a statement there we will we will define stopping times that um, that click as soon as this bound is is violated, and um, for certain C. And then we will, by a continuity argument, we can then see uh, that uh, that it, this extends to the whole to the whole spectral domain and also to all to all times. Okay, so yeah, here is again the proposition. I I guess you are now familiar with it. So the the main philosophy will be that we have to bound the the ft tilde. And yeah, as I said, we will do it on a grid in time and in so to say space. So in in t and in z. So to that end, we define the following, the following quantity. So we have a T L, which is L times N to the minus 12. Um, and the L runs 
from one up to n to the 12th, right? This is this standard notation. I used it already times today. Um, hope this did not confuse anyone. Uh, so that's the first, that's for, for time, so to say. And now we come through the space discretization. Uh, so ZM, which has real part EM and imaginary part eta M, uh, which are defined as follows. So I have an integral row semicircle, the X, so in some sense, these are quantiles. Um, the EMs are also some kind of, uh, sorry, it should be an EM. Um, these are quantiles and then the eta is, is defined uh, such that we're in the spectral domain S. So it's I and eta and kappa of EM to the one half. Okay, and yeah, here we have the same kind of grid. So N, uh, M is in N to the, to the 12. Okay, and then as I said before, so in order to define the events uh, where, the, where the bound is, is somewhat satisfied up to the time TL and in M, this we define now as, as kind of stopping times. So, well not as kind of, but they are the stopping times. So I have a tau LM, which is defined as infimum for S in zero TL. Um, such that the imaginary part of F S tilde Z of M, but now evolved along these characteristics, uh, TL minus S is bigger than N to the gamma over two divided by two uh, E M to the one half. Uh, yeah, good point. There's no I here. Thanks. Um, and uh, and then this this maximum kappa e m to the one half t. So this is this event. Uh, so the infimum of of this thing here for l and um, for L and M in yeah the same range as before uh, into the 12. So that's the, the first one. And then uh, we have a tau zero, which in some sense we already know that it's, uh, that it's one with very high probability uh, because that measures when there is a K such that, um, x k nu of t minus gamma is bigger than uh, n to the gamma over two minus two third k hat. Uh, let's make a little bit more space. Mm, to the minus one third. So yeah, that in some sense measures rigidity. So this we already know by by the proposition 5.3 that this doesn't happen. And finally, the tau is now the minimum of tau zero and the minimum tau LM, where LM run, oh sorry, this is 12. Um, and we want to be in the spectral domain. So the kappa of E should be sufficiently big. I think it was two gamma into the minus two third. Uh, okay, and yeah, I should make some important convention. Um, so I guess it's it's common to, to say that if the that the infimum um, 
of the empty set is, is plus infinity. Um, but here, since kind of our, our world in time ends at time equal to one, uh, we want that the infimum is, uh, of the empty set is, is one. And then, um, yeah, the important observation is note that uh, tau LM and tau zero are stopping times. Uh, yeah, with respect to the usual filtration that we use in this in this business. So um, with respect to FT, and yeah, the filtration is defined as um, well, the filtration that comes from the Brownian motions uh, when when s is smaller than t and k is in n. Um, and yeah, of course, also from the initial conditions. Which are also random here. Okay, so these are stopping times, and so we can use them for um, yeah. So that's a helpful observation for many for many steps. And now um, I want to define uh, certain events when uh, well certain supremum is bounded, and then after this definition, I will give three three claims, and all the three of them together will um, will directly imply the proposition. And um, and then we will we will go through the proofs of of these three claims. So the event is this A L M K. So it depends on these three parameters, and it looks as follows. So it's that the event that the supremum, when I take u in the time interval T L L plus one of the absolute value of the following stochastic integral. So VKS, DVKS, uh, ZM minus KS squared, this supremum should be smaller than uh, N to the minus four. Uh, yeah. L and, L and M are as usual out of the N to the 12 and the K is in N. Um, where does this thing come from? Well, if you look at the definition of, um, if you look at the definition of the FT tilde, and then actually there was a, um, I will recall this in a minute, uh, we had a statement that gave us the the time evolution of the ft tilde in the well in the usual sense as a as a stochastic differential equation or as a um, yeah as a stochastic differential equation and then these were the these were the diffusion terms that appeared there and uh, so the al uh, almk event says that the diffusion uh, term is not too big and then it will actually on this event we will see that everything is governed by the so to say, by the evolution of the of the time, by the by the drift terms, and uh, that will somehow be captured in the following uh, or inside the proof of the following claims. And yes, yeah, I as I already said, so um, I should be more explicit. So the proposition five point four. Uh, follows directly follows directly from the following three claims. So um, the claim one is in some sense the continuity argument. So that says that if the tau is one, and the uh, and then there's an event A, which will be the the intersection of all A and Ks. I define it directly. This is a subset of the Z in S, uh, T in one, 
t in zero one uh, such that the inf uh, on and the event is that the not infimum the imaginary part of f t tilde is smaller than n to the gamma over two kappa e maximum kappa e to the one half t okay uh, where yeah the a is the as i said the intersection over all a m case Okay, so what does this say, tell us? So, well, it says that if the tau is one and all K L M M so, uh, K, sorry, A L M K holds, then it actually, this event also holds for all Z and, Z and S and for all times. So that's of course the event that we're interested in. And, um, and that's, yeah, as I said, this is in some sense the, the continuity, so maybe I, make it as a uh, as a remark here union bound plus continuity argument to get the uniformity in uh, to get um, uh, to control event simultaneously simultaneously in t and z uh, well and of course k well k is true um okay so do you see it so the uh so if the if the tau is one then somehow these these statements here so the, the estimate that we want to prove holds um for at least this up to these discrete times and and at these points ZM. Um, and then here we can approximate, we can approximate a general Z by those. So that's the that's the, the punchline of this or the the idea of this claim. And then the second claim is that the A L M K uh, occurs with very high probability. Uh, and the third claim is that uh, tau is equal to one. With very high probability. So now before going into the, before going into the proofs, uh, why does this, this proof what we want? So, well, if I, if I know all uh, these three claims, then um, then by claim two, I can conclude that the event A occurs with very high probability because it's like a, well, it's the union over N, N to the C many, um, or it's the intersection of N to the C many events, which all occur with very high probability. So also this uh, intersection occurs with very high probability. So that's the, re the reason for this is if you, if you take the well, if you want to prove with very high probability that A occurs with very high probability, you have to take the complement of of A. So you have to take the probability of the union of all complements of this A L and M K. Um, but they individually occur with very high probability. So by playing around with the D's, uh, you can occur. The, uh, you can incorporate this because yeah, these are uh, how many events? These are two. These are uh, two times n to the, uh, yeah, well, it's n to the, I don't know, 50 events or something. Um, so, so that's clearly bounded, uh, well, uh, n to the bounded number of, of unions that one has to take, so that's fine. So we know that A occurs with very high probability, T equal to one, uh, that event also occurs with very high probability. So we have a, this is a very high probability event. Uh, which is a subset of this event which we're interested in. So this also has to hold with very high probability and that's what we wanted to prove. So all that remains to be done is, is to prove these three, 
these three claims. And um, yeah, we will now go through them uh, step by step. So first, um, uh, yeah, so we start with the, with the proof of claim one. Um, so we can, we can fix a Z and a T in, in zero one. Um, and then we have to prove that for these combinations we find uh, in some sense, yeah, we can prove that that this is controlled once it's controlled for all ZMs uh, and for all times. So for all times TL. So we now choose an M and an L such that the following holds, namely such that TL minus one is smaller than T, smaller than TL. Here I'm using the convention that T zero, that was not defined before is zero. And the Z, which, yeah, we can assume that it's um, N to the minus five close. It's not optimal, but that, that, will, that will be enough. So since we know that uh, uh, tau zero is one, uh, we have, as we had, as we were used before, that the uh, mu k zero minus lambda k zero is smaller than say two and gamma over two and to the minus two thirds k to the minus one third. And yeah, I just need some very root bo uh, crude bound here. Um, so for example, one does the job. So, um, so by definition, the V, the infim, infimum nor, uh, supremum norm of uh, V at zero is one. Uh, and therefore we get the same for all components and times uh, by this proposition 5.1. And um, yeah, for all K, for all T. And um, and then one can just do a uh, one can do a Lipschitz um, uh, yeah one can estimate the derivative of the F T tilde uh, just by writing out its definition one can see and differentiating I would don't will not do it in too many details but one can easily see that this is bounded by n times supremum norm of vt into the eta to the minus two, so n eta to the minus two, and hence, um, if I, well, our eta is, is uh, Our eta is, is at, mo uh, at least uh, one over n. Uh, so this is bounded by n to the minus three, but then the t's uh, or the z's are very close. So if I take the zt, uh, sorry, if I take the f tilde at z and at zm, then this is smaller than n to the minus two. Uh, yeah, just because of, of this assumption here. And then, uh, yeah, now comes what I already said before. I can give you the time evolution of the L, uh, of the, sorry, of the F, uh, F tilde. So by lemma, this I recorded in lemma 5.2. I, I know that I didn't prove it, but this is some well, somewhat simple computation with the, with the Ito's formula. Um, so this is looked at like this and, um, dt. and now you see the drift term that, uh, sorry, now you, you see the diffusion term that comes in, in the definition of the, of the events ALMK. 
k z minus x k uh, well t squared d k t okay so that's the that's the estimate we had before and now if you combine all of those um Uh, so yeah, one can. Uh, so now the idea will be that I estimate all of these coefficients, um, and then I will get the and then I'll get the desired continuity there as well, and then we can combine everything to control the the imaginary part of f t tilde at at z. Um, yeah. So the s t was the Steelchus transform that has the usual uh, one over eta bound. So that's trivial. And then as before, you can just differentiate the ft tilde with respect to z. You will see that this is easily bounded by uh, n times eta to the minus two. And similarly, the, the second derivative looks, uh, well, you can, you can do the same, but you will get one power in eta more. Um, and these, if you put all of these trivial uh, estimates together to control the coefficients here, and then you use the distance, uh, the, the time, the difference in time. So then you see that the TM, sorry, the F tilde at time T evaluated at the point ZM, if I compare that, if I'm at the time TL, then this is smaller than n to the minus two, at least if I'm on this event. Uh, AKL, uh, sorry, the union over the ALMs and all the intersection in K. Okay, um, so now I, I know what I know what happens if I change the z, and I know what happens if I change the time. Uh, I can put I can put these things together uh, to prove the the first claim. So what I'm interested in is I want to estimate the imaginary part of f t tilde at the point z. So I first replace the z. Uh, by the other uh, variable, that means I lost an n to the minus two, then I can replace the uh, time. So I can go from time uh, t to time tl, and I lost another n to the minus two. And uh, now I can put th these things together so this here is now controlled by n to the gamma over two um, times the um, uh, uh, well. Uh, let me write the result and then I I explain how how one gets there. So unsurprisingly, I claim that we get what was expected and why is this so well i can so this has a this has a number of inputs so first of all i use that the tau lm is 1 so this so this here is bounded by its uh, its counterpart when the e here is replaced by the em uh, and here i have another over 2 and then i can control all of the uh, upcoming error terms by the other by the other uh, things. So what else did I use? I used that the kappa of E is the same as the kappa EM up to a quite small error term, namely n to the minus five. That's because the, the Z and the ZM are close. And then finally I can absorb the rest into the into the gamma over C 
this is bigger than one half of what is what is still left so this is bigger than c to the n minus 2 as the z was in s so there we had some sufficient uh, distance from the from the boundary okay so that proves the uh, that proves the first claim and um, and now we, the, in the second claim, we prove that these A's occur with very high probability. And, uh, and then in the third, we have to, third claim, we have to look at the tau. Okay, so, um, uh, so yeah, we, we will first define some, well, it's a martingale, so uh, with, uh, M U. That's defined as follows. So it's the integral up to time t, starting at time l of the argument uh, in the in the definition of the A L M A L M K. Uh, so we evaluate at Z M. Uh, k uh, x k s squared so that's the martingale we want to look at um, and then we have the following we want to smuggle in so what we have to estimate is that this probability here is small uh, and it will be helpful to smuggle in the tau zero which we can control by proposition um, by proposition 5.3 so, and then what is left here is we have to estimate the supremum tau l u, uh, sorry, t l plus one absolute value of m u is bigger than n to the minus four. Uh, and here we can smuggle in the tau zero being one. So, um, if the tau zero is one, then I can smuggle it in here uh, because then I don't change anything if I replace the u by the minimum of u and, and tau zero, because anyways, the tau zero is one. So it, in this regime, it doesn't, doesn't make any, any difference. So uh, I keep this probability here for now. So that's smaller than the supremum tau l u, uh, sorry, t l, t l plus one m u minimum of minimum with um, with tau uh, bigger than n to the minus four so yeah, as i said here i use that the uh, t l plus one is smaller than one which is the tau zero at this event um and now i do the usual thing so now i want to estimate the supremum of a martingale so i can use this uh, inequal um, well first of all i can cause it estimate in probability i can convert it to an estimate in in moment sense um, by using markov's inequality and then i can use uh, this uh, backholder davis gundy inequality which transfer transforms the moment estimate on the supremum of a martingale into a moment estimate on the quadratic variation um, which is of course then then easier to to deal with so that's what we want to do now so let me first write the results so there's a cp then i have the expectation of quadratic variation sorry should be zero here tau zero at time tl plus one and now here outside I took the 2p moment so I have an n to the minus 8p um, but then when I look at the quadratic variation I get a, only a p here um, so yeah what did I do here well I used um, Markov's inequality um, plus theorem 320, which was this um, backholder 
Davis Gundy inequality, which relates the supremum of a martingale with the quadratic variation. And uh, now we are almost done with this claim too, because we can easily compute uh, the quadratic variation of, of such a, a martingale. Well, this is just what we did in lemma uh, 321. Um, so it's TL, TL plus one minimum tau zero. And then I have to square the, uh, I have to square the argument here and then the DB integral becomes a DS integral. So that's this, this usual formula. So I have a VKS squared ZM minus XK S to the four DS. And now, uh, well, of course, this guy I can forget about. This here I can bound by using the, the tau zero. Um, and then this year I can bound by the difference bit, by the, its imaginary part to the fourth power, of course. And then I have here the length of the, of the inter interval. So uh, maybe I first say what I use. So the V tau infinity norm is smaller than the V zero infinity norm, which I was smaller than one. And the other thing that I can use is that the tau L plus one, TL plus one minus TL, this is n to the minus 12. So putting these things together, n to the minus 12 times one divided by n to the minus one plus gamma, still at least an, an upper bound to the four, and then if you put this together, this is n to the minus eight minus four gamma, and then these four gamma, this will this will save us. So uh, because this this n to the minus eight cancels with this here, but then I still have an n to the minus four gamma times p. So that's the the thing where we are gaining from. So hence the probability L M K complement is smaller than the probability that tau zero is smaller than one plus the CP into the minus four P gamma. And uh, yeah, thus uh, these, uh, tau zero being one with a very high probability by the proposition that I sketched before. Uh, very high. By this proposition, 5.3, this implies uh, length two. Okay, and now um, I'm running a bit out of time, so uh, yeah, I will just sketch the um, sketch the idea for the proof of of claim three, um, which has well maybe let me say here yes, sketch. Um, so the the core of the proof is is kind of an uh, proof by contradiction. So we assume that the minimum of this tau L M, uh, this, that this is strictly smaller than one. So this here where the, where the conditions, uh, the minus third is, is smaller than one. And then um, I take the smallest L Uh, such that tau L M is equal to tau uh, for some M in N to the N to the 12. So then I know that, um, uh, so then I know that I can use the, the properties that are imposed by this, um, by these times, uh, 
uh, sorry, uh, then I can use that up to the time tau LM, still all the properties that are imposed by the, by the stopping times in the definition of tau hold. And then I want to construct a, a contradiction out of this. Okay. And then, um, so I want to call T to be the, this TL and Z uh, I define as E plus I eta. Uh, and that's this ZM for this, uh, uh, yeah, such that TLM is tau. Okay, and um, now to make the notation a bit shorter, I define a G U of Z, which is just the, the F, sorry, at F U tilde, and then evolved according to this, to this characteristics, Z T, Z T U. And now the, uh, now we show the contradiction, the contra contradiction that uh, imaginary part G U of Z is smaller than N gamma over two half kappa E to the one half uh, and then, then this maximum. Uh, yeah, and this for all u smaller than t minimum tau. Okay, so that so we assume somewhat that um, the stopping time is, is small, strictly smaller than one, and then we prove a then we conclude a, a contradiction. Um, so now I now I always write one can check if there's some work to be done, but I don't have time to do it. So uh, so one can check that uh, uh, yeah, so the, I need that the imaginary part of G at time zero is actually much smaller than this. So over 10 say, uh, times the maximum. Okay, maybe not all of this should have been blue, but well. Um, and then I, I need to, to control uh, the difference, namely imaginary part G U of Z minus the imaginary part G zero of Z. If this is also small then by the initial, initial one, we can control everything. Um, so, And this one can do by, by Ito's formula. Uh, by Ito's formula. This is again a bit longer, one can see that. Uh, and then you can, you get a differential equation for this. DTU, uh, DU, minus and then the fusion term um, looks very similar to what we've seen before. Uh, D, B, K, U, um, where the epsilon uh, looks as follows. Epsilon of W is S U of W minus M of W. Uh, D Z uh, F U tilde plus one over M D Z squared F U. And yeah, it looks a bit similar um, than what we had in lemma in lemma five point two. Um, Okay, and now one will, uh, yeah, and this I guess I don't have too much time for. Uh, so yeah, so 
maybe I say uh, we have to bound uh, one, two, and three. So this here is one. Uh, sorry, the whole whole thing here is one. This here is two, and this here is three. Um, and then yeah, let me just say one word about each thing, and then we make the exercise session a bit smaller. And if I think we have not too much things to do today, and if not, I can write up something. So um, so one follows from a local law, right? Um, that we sketched in proposition 5.3. And um, and then, well, one has to, to make, uh, and there are certain other elementary, elementary computations. Um, yeah, so derivative of, of F tilde. Um, yeah, so maybe that's all I want to say because this is very sketchy. Um, and maybe plus the, uh, yeah, maybe here it's better I say controlling derivative of F tilde with the imaginary part of of F tilde. Um, second is the same, it's this same idea here, copy, paste. Um, and then the third part is maybe the most, the most interesting. Um, also, I will, I will just sketch it. So, um, I define this, I define the, uh, the MS, uh, find another ms uh, or maybe i call it tilde um, where integrate up to tau this the diffusion term square root n uh, some k from one up to n d k u t minus u k u squared uh, du and um, and then one can show that's again uh, some estimate actually that's the most <laughs> most complicated among these one can show uh, one can show that so if I look at the quadratic variation of this m tilde uh, at time t then this is say smaller than n to the gamma over 10, uh, kappa of E. Now there's no square root here because the, uh, well, the quadratic variation is in some sense the square of the martingale uh, with very high probability. Um, and then you can, so yeah, this I again don't want to do. And then one can use again this theorem uh, 312, uh, 320. So this inequality, which compares the martingale with this quadratic variation, uh, and this goes similar as in the uh, in the proof of claim two. Um, then one one can get the supremum. One can control the supremum of this martingale m s tilde absolute value with very high probability, and I guess one gets something like n to the uh, gamma over four, and then the term that we want. Uh, should also with very high probability. Um, so that completes claim three. 
or at least in a very sketchy way. And then that also completes the proposition uh, 5.4. And then uh, that, that should give everything. Uh, we had to prove this semester, uh, at, least, uh, at least I provided a sketch for everything and gave some, gave some of the main ideas. Um, yeah, then I think that's, that's all I wanted to say for now. Uh, so yeah, thank you for your attention and then see you later in the, in the exercise session.